Okay, hi Joe. Welcome to OTT Talks. Hi, thanks for having me today. Okay, well, first of all, congratulations on your new book, Screens, Research and Hypertext. Um, I'm thanks. very excited to have this conversation with you. I've been following your writing on this topic for a little while. I think in 2020, you published an article on OTT and um, called Researchers in Linear, so why are reports? And um, as you know, at OTT, we've done some experimenting with, with non-linear reports in some of our projects. Um, and now we have this fuller exploration of, of um, non-linear writing and reading. But I wanna start by asking you, for those who haven't been with you on this journey, can you tell us a little bit more about what do we mean by, by non-linear writing and hypertext? Sure. Um, so first, thanks for the uh, um, for the nice introduction and for the congratulations. So um, I've also been following the the work that you've been doing on this front, and it's been really fascinating stuff. So it's uh, it's very cool to see you, um, you know, kind of trying out new things and you know being being able to get folks on board with uh, with trying out those new things for them. So um, congratulations as well. Um, so what, what do we mean by nonlinear stuff? So um, it's a really good question. Um, it's in some ways easier to talk about what it's what it's not. So the you know a, a kind of linear text is is the normal sort of thing you get where you know you have um, one paragraph above the next, above the next, above the next, and kind of each one sort of builds on the last one so that you get over the course of a, a of the whole thing, you get either a you know a story that unfolds sequentially, or you get an argument that builds sequentially. Um, a a nonlinear text would, uh, you know, kind of throws all of that out. So instead of, uh, you know, in, instead of this thing where you've got, you know, a paragraph above the next one above the next one, you might take a little section. Um, and you put it on one screen, and then you have another section that is on a whole different screen, um, and a third section on a whole different screen. Um, and when people get to the end of the first one, you give them a choice between which things you want to read next. So it's it's kind of like the um, like those old fashioned choose your own adventure books that I um, sometimes read as a kid, um, but done in I um, kind of with hyperlinks rather than um, with flipped page 400 or flipped to page 80 kind of thing. Great, yeah, I, I really like this quote from your book where you say the web has transformed how we consume information but it's done remarkably little to change how we produce it. And that perhaps there's a missed opportunity here. It, it feels like a very radical idea to me. I think what you're doing is, is challenging some really deeply ingrained ways of working, thinking in the research sector. So I wanna kind of dig into that a little bit and, and, and see what it means in practice. So first of all, from the author's perspective, you talk in the book about the non-linear approach meaning giving up a certain degree of control right yeah yeah so there i mean it's control but it's arguably the that control has always been an, a little bit of an illusion so back in the um in the 60s i think uh, a literary theorist i'm sorry i'm going to get really geeky here for a minute so just throw something at me if i should stop um, but a, a literary theorist by the name of roland barth wrote this this kind of what has since become at least in academic terms a, a kind of famous essay called the the death of the author um, and so you'll see this idea is thrown around sometimes and it for um, in in his context, it was uh, it was really meant to be about how we interpret texts, and it, there had always been this this sort of emphasis on the author's biography, the author's experiences, the author's intentions as being the kind of the primary way for interpreting a, a given text. Um, Barth argued that this is it was the kind of the wrong way around and that what really matters in interpreting a text is what the what the reader takes away from the text that it's it's not really about what the author intended it's what the what the reader gets out of it um Bart has become pretty famous in um his, in some ways the kind of the the 
patron saint of people talking about hypertext, because what hypertext did is really take that idea and, um, and in some ways make it literal um, by, um, by, by sort of severing that, that, that sense of control of the author saying, here's how the story should be told, um, and really flipping it around so that the, the reader is in charge of how the story gets told. Um, so that's arguably it's the way people have always been reading texts, but it's it's not the way that people have that authors have been thinking about approaching text. It, it feels like you're in control of the text when you are the person who is is writing a traditional linear document. That's really interesting. Um, so it's flipping it from thinking about the author's experience to thinking about the reader's experience, and what we're doing with nonlinear writing is facilitating them to experience it in a, in a different way and I really like the art exhibition analogy that you use in the book so if you think about our research as being in an art exhibit every visitor will take a different journey through that exhibition stopping at the paintings that are interesting to them and then each visitor leaves having had a unique experience and drawing their own conclusions from that so that's really interesting but what I what Something that occurs to me as a, as a research communicator who spent a lot of their career trying to organize a lot of text in a very linear way to make it make sense for what we're constantly told busy readers who don't have time to, you know, who don't have time. We need to tell them in a short, concise way, this is what you should think and do. Um, and there's no, I think there's no questioning that we know that people learn, learning is deeper, it's more meaningful when people are active participants in it and when they're able to come to conclusions themselves. But then this goes against this kind of this way of thinking in, in, in the research sector um, about needing to kind of spoon feed people recommendations, etc. Do you think policy audiences have time for a nonlinear reading or is it not about time, is it? Yeah, do you know what I, I'm trying to say here? <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, so I think there are, there are a couple of things. It's a really good point, and I um, I I think it's a it's a fair one that I it, it's hard to imagine any you know sort of a member of Congress sitting down and saying I'm going to spend the next you know hour poking around this choose your own adventure sort of thing to I um, to find what I'm looking for. Um, but I think you could say the same thing about the, uh, you know, the like big honking report that um, that comes out at the at the end of a lot of research projects too. So what I have in mind is uh, is less a replacement for every sort of research communication, and more a replacement for those big reports. Um, so it's it's a way of. Um, I think a, a better way of doing that, that sort of long form, we need to give you all the uh, um, kind of all the information needs to be included. Um, I think it's a, it's a better way of presenting that um, in part because it breaks that sort of thing down into a more modular way. So you can point to a specific bit that answers a specific question um, without needing to dig through an 80 page PDF to find that particular bit. Um, but I, I don't think it's going to make the make obsolete the sort of work that you do day in and day out, where you say, in addition to the big thing, we also need the blog posts and the infographics and the you know the tweets and so forth. So it's it's not a sort of one size fits all replacement, but I think it is a replacement for the you know, for kind of the the big main output that we often think of as as the thing that research produces wrongly yeah. think that is the thing but you know um. I have to say when I was reading through the book from a from a right from an author's perspective there is certainly this idea of relinquishing some control but I also find the idea quite liberating as well you know again in this kind of role that I play as a research communicator taking a lot of content and trying to sometimes force that into a linear narrative there's so many ways you could piece it together and actually it feels quite liberating to think we can just take a collection of ideas or questions and piece them together in a non-linear way rather than trying to find the perfect kind of line. But I'll admit that from a reader's perspective when I started reading the book and I did start reading it on my phone, on my, my cell phone, which I know 
later you, you recommend not doing. But I found it quite uncomfortable to start with because I found myself thinking, what if I'm gonna miss something really important? How do I know how much more there is to read? And I still don't know that I've actually read everything. And maybe that's you know not important. Um, but the, the art gallery um, analogy helped me. But I was wondering like, how much is this about needing to retrain ourselves in terms of how we how we read or how we think about research output. Yeah, there's. I, th I think there's there there's definitely some retraining. I think there's some being. Um, well, so I I talk at one point about uh, um, Pierre Baird's um, book, How to Talk About Books You Haven't Read, um, which is a is sort of a, a, a cheeky title for um you know for for a book um but one of the points that he's making throughout is that um, there is no sort of set meaning of to read a thing that i um and you know one of the one of the things that really really stuck with me from his book is that every act of reading is equally an act of starting to forget so you know by the time you have gotten through the first bit You've, you know, especially if, if it's a thing that takes you, you know, a couple of weeks to uh, to go through, you've, you've forgotten a lot of the details at the beginning of the um, of the book. So I, I think we tend to think of reading as just the straightforward thing where I start here and I finish here and then I have read it. But if, you know, if I have read a thing and have forgotten three quarters of it, is that really any different from somebody who just skimmed the thing in the first place? So I think some of it is is just sort of being more being more conscious of our our relationship with what what it really means to talk about having having read a thing in the um, even in the first place. Um, but I I do think there's a, there's a certain extent to which when we're doing research um, in particular we already read in this very disjointed sort of way. That you know, I, I talk about my my own process of starting to uh, starting to do the research for this book. I I started by picking up a book on um, um, sort of digital rhetoric um, and started reading through it, and then realized that I had forgotten everything that I actually thought I knew about rhetoric. Um, so I just kind of stop and go back, and I you know reread Aristotle and Cicero to remember what what is rhetoric in the first place. Um, and then I came back and got a little deeper and realized there's all this talk about various literary theorists and I had no idea who they were. Um, so I had to stop and go look them up and sort of get some more background to come back to the book. So I, I think there's always this sense in which research is this, it is this sort of kind of non-linear process where we get sidetracked, we get derailed, we got, dive really deeply into something, then we pull back to where we were before. Um, so it's um, it, the, the difference is that we don't usually have that experience within a single text. We're usually using multiple texts when we read this way. And so what we're really doing is, is sort of applying that way to a, um, a thing that's meant to be a, a unitary text. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it, what I, one of the things I like is that your book in itself is kind of challenging a lot of preconceptions we have about for example, what is a book? Usually, you know, a book we would say it has a front cover, a back cover, beginning, middle, and end. Um, so, in itself, it's kind of it's living, it's living, it's 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 a living example of of uh, rethinking these traditional formats. And I, I do think that in research, there's we have a lot of format hierarchy, right? You know, in terms, especially in what's counted as evidence, citations. There are peer-reviewed journal articles. You know, if something's in a formal PDF, then then it has perhaps more weight than an, an online article. So again, I think you know, is, is this about just challenging a lot of these existing hierarchies? I was also I was wondering, do we need to set up a, the first non-linear peer-reviewed journal, where journal articles are all a non-linear experience, but they're, they're peer-reviewed and they they you know, live up to the rigor of what we're used to when we think of an article. It's really interesting, and I um, I will say it gives me I um, I'm I'm now having kind of a little bit of a horror trying to imagine being a peer reviewer and given a nonlinear thing and saying go tell me how to like, I would have no idea how to peer review that to be honest, 
Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, I think that's a, that's a really excellent point, and it, um, it's it's certainly the case that in the in the research community, there's there's a there's definitely a, a hierarchy, and it it goes not just to you know in terms of thinking about what what we produce, but it it goes into questions about you know like hiring even like you know you've written a book that counts for more than if you've written you know some reports, um, so it. it it definitely requires a kind of a, a rethinking of how what our relationship is to outputs and what count as you know sort of serious important outputs and what doesn't. Well, before we close, I wanted to ask you about what think tanks today can how they can practically apply some of this. I know in, in your the last article you published before the book, you were talking about research first reports potentially being an or being an oxymoron and that they're, they're actually more of a stopgap until we figure out a better way to, to do this. Um, so, so what can we do today? If an organization kind of convinced and thinking we want to go non-linear, how what are the, some of the tools or ways that we can start to put this into practice, do you think? It um that's a really good question, and it, um, I spent nearly as long on the book trying to figure out how to put it together um, as I did actually writing the text that went into it. Um, there, there aren't great tools for um, for doing this um, at the moment. There, we're starting to get some that are a little better. Um, it it definitely starts, and this isn't going to surprise anybody who's known me. Um, you know, it, it starts by by sort of getting rid of things that are based around a kind of a document metaphor to start with. So, you know, software is generally a, um, developers like to call it opinionated. Um, so, you know, you open up Microsoft Word and you get a thing that looks like a sheet of paper. Um, you can make or do things that aren't producing stuff that you can print out on an office printer, but you're you're kind of fighting with it the whole time because its opinion is that you should be writing a document on this uh, in this this particular thing. So it it starts with uh, with I think looking for tools that have different opinions built into the um, into them as a starting point. So it's things like uh, Notion and Obsidian, um, Rome Research, which is what I used to I um, ultimately used to to kind of put together the book. You start with a kind of a different metaphor that um, really works more at the level of a block. So a piece of content instead of being a document is um, every time you hit every time you hit the return key, it creates kind of a new piece of content that is addressable. Um, so you can uh, you can actually reference that specific uh, that specific block. You can add it to other things. Um, so it's 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 a way of treating each idea as its own unique piece of content rather than treating a kind of a whole document as a piece of content. So it, um, and there, there are lots of tools like this. It's, it's um, largely a matter of preference as to which of those that you, um, you know, you can kind of play around with them and see which, which ones you like. They people get really strong feelings about these things. Um, my, my feeling is largely, if you're not working in Microsoft Word, you're already, um, you know, way ahead of the game. So do that. Right, and just my final question, what, are there some cases where a, a PDF is just the best, best output? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, right now, given the state of the uh, um, the state of the web, if you if you're going to still produce a sort of a, a long linear document, um, as much as I'm I'm the guy who rails against PDFs, um, if I need to read a thing and really seriously engage with it. It's easier to do that by printing out a PDF than, and so I can scribble in the margins and stuff than it is to do it on a screen. And this, I think, is, is really, in a lot of ways, a failure of the web to make this easier to do. Um, but it, it's really hard to annotate stuff on, on the web. So if what you're doing is producing a, a kind of traditional document, then yeah, PDF honestly may be, I, um, in a lot of cases, the, the better way to do things. Um, certainly, if, if you're trying to get it in the hands of researchers, then 
yeah, I mean, it's still for a lot of us, it's still a lot easier to print a thing out and make scribbles on a thing than it is to try and um, try and deal with it online. Yeah. Okay. So we, we need to be investing in rethinking the infrastructure and, and ways that we, the ways that we work and the tools we have to help us to do this. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Joe. It's been a really fascinating conversation and, and we're looking forward to continuing to try out some of these ideas and we'll share our learning as well as, as we do that and looking forward to see what comes next. Fantastic. Thanks again for having me. This was a lot of fun. So I really appreciate it.